and welcome to What It Takes from Blue Ridge PBS, where we try to take a broad view of education in the Commonwealth by talking to interesting educators and experts in the region. My guests today are Rachel Hopkins from the Science Museum of Western Virginia and April Corbett of Center in the Square in downtown Roanoke. And today we'll be talking especially about how the organizations at Center pivoted to help parents, students, and educators during the pandemic. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Thank you for having us. April, I'm gonna start with you. Um, because many of our viewers uh, are outside of the Roanoke area, just talk about what Center in the Square is and, and tell us what people can expect to find when they come there. Well, sure. Center in the Square is a wonderful building that's located in downtown Roanoke in the Market Square. And it, help, it houses many, many different museums and theaters and opportunities for families to enjoy themselves and kind of expand not only um, their ability to interact with each other, but their ability to interact with their community. Right, and under the center umbrella, there are actually some organizations that aren't even housed there, correct? There are. We actually uh, help to support 10 different arts organizations in our Roanoke area, including uh, the uh, Roanoke Ballet, which are located in the Grandin area. We also help the Opera Roanoke, which their administrative offices are at Center in the Square building, but you can't visit them there. If you want to see the opera, you must go to the Jefferson Center or one of their other locations they're performing. In the building, we have Mill Mountain Theater. We have the Science Museum of Western Virginia. We have the Pinball Museum, the Starcade, uh, which is a video game museum, and we have Kids Square Museum as well. And um, through all of those kind of interactive programming, you can really, I don't know, had a well-rounded weekend or week or two weeks of a visit time in downtown. It is always interesting to talk to people who come from out of town and they, uh, my own family members recently stumbled, they had been to Center in the Square years ago, but they hadn't been in a while and with, they traveled with a very young child and they were first of all amazed by the, by the offerings there, but just the lobby and everything else, I mean, it, it is an old building that's been converted, correct? It is, it actually originally was a warehouse space um, with the feed and seed and distribution of tons of burlap bags and pickup trucks pulling up and loading and unloading of equipment. And it was renovated in the mid 1980s and became what we now know as Center in the Square. And then it's gone through a continual revitalization or renewal of itself and what it can give to the community. In the lobby area currently and uh, is fish tanks with wonderful, wonderful coral reefs with living coral in there, the, and jellyfish tanks, there are local turtle tanks. All of this is accessible and free to the general public just by coming in the doors. So Rachel, you are, uh, you've, I know you've had your job for a while now as mm -hmm. the, the director of the Science Museum of Western Virginia, but again, just tell us, uh, many people probably went there when their own kids were little but haven't been back. Mm -hmm. um, what can we expect to find at, at Science Museum? Yeah, you can expect to find a lot of new exhibits. Um, during the last year, our community's aware here in Roanoke that we operated the lab, but during that time, we also um, renovated, um, I would say four to five exhibits and then built nine new exhibits. Um, we have programming, weekly programming, monthly programming um, that's free to our patrons and members, of course. Um, and if you're, uh, if you're still a parent that finds yourself at home and you're homeschooling by choice, or it's always been your choice, mm -hmm. a lot of our, our, our families really wanted to make it clear, we've always homeschooled and we have always supported them, but we, we're someone you can reach out to now as well to supplement um, that journey as maybe new homeschooling parents. And I, we're gonna talk a lot about how COVID has changed mm -hmm. education. I know there has been a huge influx of new homeschoolers, some just for a year, some, I've met many parents who yeah. it went okay last year and they've decided that they're kind of um, going to continue it. Um, as we're in the midst of a pandemic um, still, uh, what are you all doing to make sure that when people do come to the to Center in the Square or to, or to let's talk about the Science Museum in particular, to make sure that it's very hands-on and, and tactile, mm -hmm. how are you managing that with everything that's going on? constant cleaning, um, <laughs> but we also, we learned a lot about sterilizing spaces um, and spaces that are used by different groups throughout the day. So how do you turn a space over? Um, so we learned a lot about that last year. So 
Our, te uh, our team is pretty proficient in that area. We utilize foggers, we utilize um, different type of solvents that have longer than a uh, you know, one hour time span where the, they're remi remaining viral free. So, um, but we work as a team, you know, everyone, we have schedules around the clock, um, checking spaces, um, communicating, also the, the emotional needs of this time. It's not just about, hey, this is a heavily interactive space. It's also a little bit more communication, communicating, being really open with that, with our visitors and our patrons and uh, students and educators. Luckily, you have a lot of science experts, right? So <laughs> a, good, right. a good teachable <laughs> moment to talk about yeah, yeah, epidemiology <laughs> and virology and <laughs> germs. And That's right. And one of the things we did just, you know, on the side, but also, you know, for fun that was practical was we built a mask sterilizer last year. Um, and it was also just to show kids this is how we sterilize uti utilizing ultraviolet light. But then we still use that. Um, <laughs> so for, for those of us crafty who sewed masks we're really proud of, instead of using disposable and cutting down on waste, we built a sterilizer and the kids love to walk by it in the morning and it was kind of like, this is where you drop your mask off, I'll see you tomorrow and it will be. <laughs> well, and also the first place I heard about that was University of Virginia, you know, so yeah, it's a, it's a great right. uh, application of, of mm -hmm. current science. How about the rest of, you know, the, again, that lobby, the, all the glass, um, but also the, the various venues, how, how's everybody coping and how, how, what have you had to do? Very similar to Rachel in the cleaning, uh, constant attention to cleaning and monitoring um, if there has been an extra heavy attendance in a certain area. Um, but we actually um, partnered with a group last year before we reopened when we were all shut down and had the entire building sprayed, all of the public areas. And we had green solutions in to do that and it it was kind of amazing. It was a, it was that moment in your life where you're going, okay, there's a man in full white garb spraying my entire lobby area, and it's that moment of realization. Oh, this is this is serious. Like it's not that we weren't taking the pandemic mm -hmm. seriously. It's just those moments where you suddenly go, okay, this is clean. This um, is going to be suit. Like we're, we're it ready. It looks like something it's, in, a, in yes, a movie or something. It looked right? like yes. I, I felt like I was on a movie set, going, oh, huh, mm -hmm. this is crazy. But that constant attention to uh, keeping everything clean and the communication and keeping those lines open because having so many different organizations sharing a space and then having their own protocols in place but making sure that everybody's protocols don't don't interfere with the others and and actually complement and work together as a group and sure as a because team. with a theater and you've got all your camps <coughs> going on at different times there there's a lot of different needs for mm -hmm. for different groups well let's just jump in there then and talk about sort of the immediacy, you talked about like when it first happened, what you did. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, you know, that was the case here at the station, that was every school I deal with, you know, it was sort of that, oh my goodness, in March, right. when mm -hmm. everything stopped. Um, what was that like for you, Rachel, when, mm -hmm. you know, that moment of panic or calm <laughs> or whatever it was for you? Sure, um, when the governor made, uh, you know, stated the stay at home order, um, we stayed at home, we worked remotely, we focused on our relationship as a team and trying to keep everyone strong, supported, um, and you know, adapting to, we used to be face to face, everyone sitting in our various, just like, just like in a home at the museum, we have our, our, um, our spaces that we congregate out of comfort and now this is Zoom. Um, and so we adapted. Um, at that moment, there were several members of our team that were deemed essential workers as well. Um, and that may be because they had financial or accounting responsibilities such as myself, or we have thousands of living species in the <laughs> museum, couldn't, couldn't go home and turn off the lights. And so um, at the same time, our living collections team worked to, main, you know, to make sure that everything was taken care of, what, fed what on What kind of animals are we talking about? <laughs> oh, anything from hissing cockroaches to reptiles to David Boa, who's one of our favorites, a giant boa constrictor, to, uh, we have turtles, we have lots of um, dark, poisonous dart frogs. Um, I feel bad because I'm going to forget someone <laughs> and then their sp human spokesperson is going to say, hey, um, we have Ollie who has the worst attitude probably in the building, it's a turtle, and he makes it known that his light, you know, he's in a bad mood at all times and, uh, but has a very amazing personality, super strong personality. So 
you know, we, that's where we were, is, is that first initial, you know, six to eight weeks saying, all right, we have to remain really close and we will come out of this stronger as a team. And I'm so proud to say that we did. Of course, it was, it's awkward at first, you know, but um, you have to take care of uh, the emotional needs of your team. And, and that's what we did. Everyone worked together on that. And then, then we returned and just hit the ground running and saying, we have to pivot. And, and that's what we did. Before we talk about yeah. how you pivoted, did, did you, this is just a silly mm -hmm. question for me. Did you notice any differences in behavior of animals with people not being yeah. around? Um, a little bit of relief, but the way that we operate our department is, so we have program animals, um, animals that are used um, every single day on a weekly basis in the museum, twice weekly actually, and we try to give them breaks anyway. You know, I think they, they got a lot, a little bit more one-on-one -on -one attention, you know, because our living collections director and assistant director weren't being pulled away for programming or for other needs. Um, we also, in, in the very beginning, you know, we were trying to maintain a sense of humor. And for example, we took some of our uh, members of living collections into the garden and let them roam around and made some fun videos. Um, and I think maybe, maybe that was one step too far. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's yeah. like uh, letting your kid eat a bowl of ice cream at 11 and then the next night they're expecting they it. They want to go <laughs> back yeah. out there again. So, but well, I think we're so all experiencing that with our dogs now as we yeah. go back to work and, we, and, we, and uh, we have to tell our dogs I'm not going to yeah, be here all the time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so let's talk, uh, April, you all, when, a after you had that initial shock and sure. I'm sure because you all serve a lot of the business needs of the organizations within your group, there was probably just a lot of fear of, you know, can we survive this before we knew if there was going to be any government aid or any of those things. Um, how important was the role that Center normally plays to all of your members? Well, that's a that that moment for us was was a pretty frightening one. It was that moment where you go, okay, contingency plans. What are the contingency plans to keep the lights on? the heat on for the animals and the i mean we have fish we have there are, there are living creatures even if all the humans leave the building so to speak there are still living creatures in that building and how do we keep them and sustain them not only that but then how do you maintain that building on multiple buildings and prepare for when time can come back so there was a lot of conversations about the step down plan of how many, okay, we can go, this is a phase one, this is a phase two, do we need to release people here? Okay, we hear tricklings of you can apply for this grant. Okay, if we apply for this grant and we got this grant, this is what we can do. Um, we did a lot of that. And then there was also that moment where uh, Dr. Jim Sears looked at me and he said, okay, so I hired you to um, do some special events and uh, to do my administrative stuff and now, well, I can administer myself, and we can't do any special events. So what else can you do? And I suddenly went, oh, okay. And I, I sat there for, a, I remember that moment and going, all right, all right, let's, let's figure out how to make some money. Like that's, that's my job. I normally do it by, by throwing big events or finding reoccurring moments uh, for organizations of things that will draw a crowd on a, on a yearly basis or, or, or whatnot. And so that was the opportunity for Center to start to grow their field trip program and take our Get School field trip program and move it into a virtual field. Um, and for us and where we've come with that in this 18 months, it's just, it's been incredible. Um, I look at it as a moment of you can either sit down and cry about the fact that you're going to be stuck at home or you can get back up and say, all right, let's roll up our sleeves, let's do something. And I think Rachel's programming that they did with their lab program and what we were able to accomplish with our Get School program did just that. It was a roll up your sleeves moment of let's, let's do something, let's get out there, let's help our community. Just talk about what, what happened once you got a sense of what was going yeah, on. Sure, uh, well one, one story which is kind of cool and this is right before, you know, we're sitting there and we're thinking the lab's gonna happen. And I have to say, that was in June. We, we knew something, you know, this is happening, this isn't, you know, a lot of people had this, um, this concept in their minds or this prediction of how long this would last. Um, and we started to, f we've had a strong relationship with um, all of the schools, different localities in, you know, southwestern Virginia, and we could feel by 
the pressure that they were relating in meetings, something big's coming. Um, homeschoolers need our support because we're all going to become unintentional homeschoolers. So uh, we went into the planetarium, which is opening, the new planetarium will be opening next year. And we had edu educational materials for days, you know, that people have donated um, for the last 50 years. We're 50 years old this year. These were things that were just stored in the old in the planetarium <laughs> yeah. that's waiting. Yeah, renovation. and I said, I went and talked to the farmers and DRI, and I said, this Saturday, and, and they were feeling it too, you know, a decline in um, people coming down on Saturday. Let's, let's do a big bazaar, free educational materials. Uh, we thought we'd be down there for a long time and that it'd be kind of be come and go. We walked out that morning onto the market square and there were over 300 families. Just waiting for materials. Yeah, it, it was a 30 minute event. <laughs> <laughs> we also gave away plants. We gave away, just to just take these things, plants, learning resources. So, you know, a couple months later, we're, we're launching um, the lab and we were able to provide a, um, a safe space for children to learn every day from eight till 5.30. So these were kids coming in? On site, every single day, K through, and, and pre-K I'll say, because we did add that on, pre-K through seven. Um, and predominantly these were children whose parents worked in local government essential, um, essential workers at Carillion. Um, and the work that they needed to continue to do um, was, it's pretty important for our community to stay afloat. And, and as a parent, we all, you know, we know, um, you cannot go to work and feel a sense of peace or even uh, y you have to have your focus will be disrupted if your child isn't taken care of. So we thought we got this um, and, and we continued to do that until May and then, you know, we reopened on June 2nd. Uh, so we had about six weeks where we condensed our classrooms down because some students went back on site. And so that's how we were able to very quickly um, create new exhibits and wasn't easy. I'm, I'm simple. And I want to talk about the new yeah. exhibit. One thing that's really striking me and as somebody who, you know, you're, you're, you're a director of an organization with a lot of moving parts, but your first concern was, how's everybody feeling? How's everybody mm -hmm. doing? Absolutely. Do, do people feel supported? Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's so important. That it's without that, it, without having a, uh, people always talk about separation of work and home, you know, all of this. You know what, when I see my employees coming to work and they're stressed, it's important that I acknowledge that and also s make room for it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I remember when I first started out, I was nervous about that. You know, I had, <laughs> maybe I've had some examples of leadership in my life where it didn't allow for that. And I didn't know who I was as a leader. And I can just tell you that this year really didn't just teach me about leadership. Every leader in, in my organization learned so much. You know, we learned so much about respect. We learned so much about uh, people ask me, wh the, one of the first things I say is respect for our community educators. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Right. It's, that's. Educators have drawn the short stick and have responded just universally with all of this. Mm -hmm. As it became clear that more aid was going to be available, that organizations were going to mostly be okay. I don't know if they all are, but mm -hmm. mostly. Um, how did you, how did Center help support all of the organizations with those, comp I, I was involved in filling out some of those forms for, <laughs> for grants and things. Was that something you all got involved in? Um, yes and no. We were there as a resource for everyone mm -hmm. um, in case they wanted opportunities for that. Tara Marciniak is our um, Director of Institutional Advancement and she filled out all of our paperwork, bless her, because that is not my forte That's a thankless at all. job it, for sure. It is. It's one that I, I am much more of the creative side and the problem solver and the collaborator. The form's not my thing. So she filled all of those out for Center and, um, and then offered her services to other organizations within the family as well. I know there were conversations as well with, um, with the History Museum and the O. Winston Lake Museum, which are housed over at the old um, passenger station. Sure. And um, that because the needs not just of how to maintain your staff or run your museum or how everybody's feeling but it's all of those organizations working together it's it's amazing what you can accomplish as a group or what you can do or not do as a group if that sure. makes sense i mean sure. it's it's quite the family of sure. of uh of collaboration. And on collaboration, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there was some collaboration between Blue Ridge PBS and, and your organization and your organization. Mm -hmm. So can you guys talk about that a little bit? 
I'm going to let sure. you. You're the, <laughs> you're the mastermind behind this. <laughs> well, so um, when we started our Get Schooled virtual videos, it started with that thought. Uh, Rachel's programming with her lab was just is so incredible because I, I hope it comes back in different forms and I, I have a feeling it will. Um, but we took the, we went a different route in just keeping a virtual presence. And initially we were really kind of hopeful that it wasn't gonna need to go much farther. And so if you look back in the history on our Facebook page and on um, our website as to how we started those videos, that was me and my iPhone and some video equipment editing in my house doing uh, live Facebook lives from my from my dining room table with my children and craft nights and all of that and it grew into this programming where we started to um, get in touch with different science and social studies teachers of how we could better support programming as as kids went back to school last fall what did they need clearly kids were not going to go on field trip how could you provide those field trip opportunities one conversation leading to another I ended up collaborating with every arts organization and nonprofit in town that possibly wanted me to come visit. I went to the zoo, I went to the science museum, I went to the history museum, I went to the transportation museum, I went everywhere. I filmed your field trips and I offered them for free with support material, getting sponsorships and grants along the way to help pay for all of that. To me, this was just a great way to show people at home that they could go on a field trip safely, they could explore, they could expand and learn as a family or learn as individuals in your classroom, in your home, what have you. Well, and then even those <coughs> groups that can't make a field trip for mm -hmm. distance or cost right. or whatever, those resources, do those resources still exist? Are they those still available? Those resources still people? exist. They're still growing. And the collaboration now with Blue Ridge PBS, knowing that I now do not <laughs> edit and film all of my content has been amazing to let me focus more on the education support material on the scripts that we're writing. I have a feeling that my scripts are a lot better now than maybe they were <laughs> a year ago, but it's been really great. All that programming is offered for free um, on Blue Ridge PBS, which is awesome, and on the live streaming, but also on the Center in the Square website. All of the video links are there, all of the downloadable passports, which are the paper information. Mm -hmm. And then it was just so great that every single organization we work with gets a copy of that video to then use how they want to. And to, to show people, to what, show they're people doing, what sure. they're doing. And to me, that is the most wonderful thing, and it really hits at the heart of what Center in the Square's mission is, which is to help arts and cultural organizations expand and, and be able to focus on their missions and to increase foot traffic in our downtown area. Sure. Um, I mean, that's, that is the you mission. Want people, we want, want people, people to, to come in for But sure. if you can't personally come in yet, let's help you enjoy the resources the of Center in the Square and get sure. that experience. Now, I heard a lot there about how, I mean, COVID was, is not a good thing, right? <laughs> we, we can all agree the pandemic's a bad thing. But I've heard from many organizations that I've spoken to that they're learning lessons that are going to stay with them and that they're going to improve the way things the way they do what they do, have you, you know, think about what the way you've mm -hmm. altered what you do and how much of it will, what do you think, how much of it will stick as you go forward? Well, it, I think it'll all stick. I think that the motivation behind it and the creative minds behind it, they're all still there. Um, we are, we're an adaptable team and we, we actually love adapting. I mean, so I always say, you know, it's kind of like when you talk about STEM and specifically coding, people have so many trials and tribulations and then once you get it, it's over. So we love the process, right? Once you succeed, it's over. So I think, you know, it's, we will have challenges, you know, coming and, but I, I feel pretty confident that we'll be able to handle them. And, and as April said, a lot of the programming we developed uh, last year, Lab Junior, Lab Senior, we, we go into retirement and intentional communities and do hands-on activities. We also do all of these virtually. Um, lab chats, one of my favorites. Uh, it's kind of like Skype a scientist, but we're, we're finding some really cutting edge radical scientists that we are just bringing kids and scientists together for conversations, just like this, not lectures, conversations. This is all staying, you know? So we were able to pull some of this programming and say, all right, this is what kids, you know, moves with us into the future. And I'm really excited to without COVID there, seeing how that takes off. Right, I think, I think all of us, you know, because everything went virtual, mm -hmm. we've learned that we can talk to people at a distance. We can get people yeah. to join us, and they understand too that they can come in and 
oh, I'm a scientist, but I can come talk to some third graders mm -hmm. and I can take 15 minutes out of my time. I don't have a lot of time left, but can mm -hmm. let me know, how, how can people learn more about um, what's going on at the Science Museum? Facebook, we are on Facebook, we have Instagram, we have, we, we even have TikTok, okay? <laughs> uh, but of course our website. <laughs> and also, you know what I love? Just come, come visit. <laughs> we have no barriers, you know, if uh, we have, we, we try to eliminate all barriers to learning, so give us a call if there is a financial Great. barrier there and we'll get you through the door. Great, well, this conversation could go on for some time, but I am about out of time. So as we close the program, I'd like to thank both Rachel Hopkins from the Science Museum of Western Virginia and April Corbett of Center in the Square in downtown Roanoke for sharing your stories and your successes with us today. For what it takes, I'm Tom Landon.